Hello everyone, welcome back to It's a Wonderful Podcast. Apologies again for the delay in episode release. Pretty hectic week uh, it meant we could not even record uh, what would what was uh, supposed to be last week's episode, but will instead be this very episode you're listening to right now, episode four of It's a Wonderful Podcast. We are talking today about Guess Who's Coming to Dinner from 1967. Nolan. Nolan's here, by the way, everyone, so, as he always is, mm-hmm. because, you know, this is our show. Um, Nolan, guess who's coming to dinner? First off... Not my uh, not my date, that's for sure. No, no. <laughs> no. Um, okay, though, uh, was this a first-time watch for you? It was, and I had planned to watch this uh, last year, actually, in preparation to see Get Out, because it was one of Jordan Beale's inspirations for that movie, but I never got yes. around to it. Now, with Get Out being nominated for Best Picture, I'm glad that I could somewhat revisit it in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, so it, it's pretty clear, once you've seen sort of both of them, um, that get out does take certain things from uh from guess who's come guess who's coming to dinner although get out is more horrible with them as opposed to guess who's coming to dinner which is actually quite nice with them come the end um i don't know what your sort of because i i really do love this film it always hits me quite hard um, obviously, Spacey Tr- Spencer Tracy's uh, final monologue, but really, the majority of the film, it, it's got this the the whole message of acceptance within interracial love is is one that ho- holds a pretty sort of important place for me. Um, so it really does affect me every time I watch it. I don't know what your sort of thoughts were before going into it, apart from obviously knowing that it was one of Jordan Peele's inspirations for Get Out. I don't know what you sort of expected from it. What was that? Well, um, obviously, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner is not a horror movie. It's uh, it's mm-hmm. more... It's advertised as a comedy, but I would consider it more of a uh, dramedy. And we talked about this before with, like, uh, the screwball comedies and bringing up Baby. I think the best comedy works when it's character-driven and it doesn't take away from the main story. Like, bringing up Baby was really a story about trying to find someone who kind of understands you. This is uh, a story about wanting to feel accepted and not really wanting people to push their own agenda on you, and I think that's really important. So I gotta say, I really enjoyed this movie. Uh, I'm We're yet to do a movie on this show that I haven't liked. Well, that's good. Four episodes in, we've liked them all. This is a good start. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it seems weird to call Guess Who's Coming to Dinner a comedy. Um, I don't know if... I suppose... I suppose I suppose it is quite funny in parts. It's more sort of slight, slight wittiness on Sidney Poitier's part sometimes that uh, can cause, you know, you to smile or the quite, like, ridiculous scene when the Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy go to an ice cream parlour. That was really Which funny. is slightly out of place with the rest of the film, I always feel. But is more than entertaining in its own right. Definitely. Um, it's definitely, definitely more of a, a drama, though. And my God, especially by the end. You, oh, every one of the characters are in tears, and I presume most of the people that would watch it would be in tears by the end anyway. But for those, uh, for those people who, who don't really know the ins and outs of, of Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. What What is what is it about, Nolan? Well, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner tells the story of a 
black man who's coming to visit his uh, white girlfriend's family. So it's very much a whole... The movie basically tells you what it's about. It's guess who's coming to dinner. Yep. And then it sort of deals with that kind of uh, tension amongst them, uh, how they feel about it, how... It was interesting to me, like, how the white family in this, they are written as sort of liberal, but Mm -hmm. you can even kind of sense a little bit of tension when they're relating to stuff that they say they understand, but you get that they don't really have a grasp on it from the get-go, and that was... That's just a really interesting concept because you got to remember at the time this came out, it was one of the first movies to have an interracial marriage be depicted as a good thing for the time. So I think this movie, when it was coming out, might have had a lot riding against it, but luckily it did really well, did really well at the Oscars. It's a very good movie and has went on to inspire similar movies to do the same thing. Definitely. I mean, by this point, you know, Sidney Poitier had already fully established himself as a... Well, I always I always tend to refer to him as the first big African-American movie star. Because I think, I think he is. I think that's fair. He was the first, uh, the first black actor to ever win an Oscar. Uh, in, for best actor, I should say. Um, but yeah, this... Guess who's coming to dinner? It did. It did do well at the Oscars. Catherine Hepburn won uh, Best Supporting Actress. She was fantastic in this. Um, that award, I believe, was presented to her by Sidney Poitier, which which is wh- quite nice. Which I liked especially because I, I love seeing the idea of making a movie feeling like everyone's coming together to do something great and to have yeah. them celebrate it at award shows that. That just feels nice. It's it reminds me of when I was in, when I was a theater kid, and we all got happy because we were all putting on a show together. Yeah, I that definitely comes across, especially with the sort of the main four or the main the main group of of four actors in it. Um, going back to to Catherine Hepburn, the second Catherine Hepburn film. We've uh, we've talked about in in only four episodes of the show. Um, I'm sure she'll come back for many many more. But uh, this is this is showing how Hepburn changed from what she was doing in stuff like Bringing Up Baby to what she was doing in her later roles, because it just has it keeps the same sort of wittiness. But it just has that extra dramatic and really powerful element to it, and she, as as the mother of the, uh, I forget the actress's name all the goddamn time. <laughs> Catherine something. It's not Catherine something, is it? Because that's Catherine Hepburn. Someone. It's it's someone, but Catherine Hepburn obviously plays her mother. Uh, the the Sydney Poitier's fiance's mother. She is sort of the most the 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 one to accept the relationship almost straight off to an extent. Mm-hmm. She sort of does that, and then it's a case of almost trying to convince everyone else to, uh, especially Spencer Tracy. Um, but then, of course, when you know, Sidney Poitier, John, uh, his parents come to dinner as well, then it gets a bit more interesting when uh, the the two of those aren't particularly happy with the situation either. Um, So it really sort of, it's almost Catherine Hepburn and her daughter against everyone else. Well, and of course... Sydney Poitier, but uh, it's it's got it's a it's a film with such great character arcs um, and stories behind it because, like you said before, uh, it's said in the film that Spencer Tracy's character is uh, you know a liberal governor or was a liberal governor, um, 
so you'd think, oh, well, it'll be fine with it, you know. At, at the time this came out, civil rights was still in, you know, fully going on. Uh, it was before any, uh, you know, assassination of, uh, of Dr. King took place or anything like that. Um, so all that is obviously seriously serious stuff to, to talk about. And guess who's coming to dinner and does that wonderfully um, in terms of giving your characters that f from the outside you would think, oh, well, they, they won't have a problem with this, but then they actually do. Mm -hmm. And then they sort of actually come to realise <laughs> what is actually right and that it shouldn't matter. Once they get to know... Um, John Sidney Poitier's point of view a bit more and realise that it's better to just accept who people love than fit them with your own ideal person, quote-unquote ideal person. And that is, in essence, what the film is about, celebrating love over all, really. I mean, that's a familiar narrative even in stories that don't focus on the sort of social aspect of it. Like, I've seen stories about normal, like, I don't, I don't know, like, sort of like, um, like, you see, a, you see this in a lot of comedies nowadays, the guy who comes in and the family is of a different uh, wealth class or social mm -hmm. class and they're not accepted as well. But by doing this and making it focus on such a great issue, like such an important issue, it adds that extra layer to it and it makes it more interesting, like in a similar way that Get Out added that extra layer to the horror genre, this sort of added that layer to... I, I, once again, we don't want to say this is a comedy. I'm s No. I'm, I'm going to refer to this more as like a dramedy. It's a drama yeah. that has a lot of comedic moments in it, but they help tell the story and a lot of ways, and I'm just searching up on IMDb now, that person you're referring to, I believe her name is Catherine Houghton? So your name is, in it, her name is Catherine, I knew it was Catherine, Catherine Houghton. Houghton. H-O-H-O-U-G-H. I'm currently searching if there's any relation to a Patrick Houghton. I don't think there <laughs> is, though. No. Um, yeah. Guess who's coming to dinner? It's I think it's so well remembered because obviously it's an import. It was an imp it would have been an important message regardless of the time it came out. It was an important message last year in the film Get Out. It's still an important message that people need to send. But at that time, nineteen sixty seven, you've got to remember this came out in the US. Um, it was a very racially tense time and to bring this interracial couple together with a celebration of love was a wonderful thing and i think it's so it's so well revered now because it was almost i, d I don't like to use the word iconic <laughs> your name terms, is not al rudnick no it's not but in terms of just everything fitting together in the world it came out in so perfectly. How could a film like this not be remembered for decades and decades and decades? Exactly. It just has to be. And, you know, this is looking aside from the individual performances, which are, are wonderful. I don't know who your favourite one is uh, in the film, but I'm going to go with Hepburn again. Because I just love her so much, but um, I don't know. It's a difficult. It's a difficult one. Who do you reckon? Well, when I'm looking at why I like a performance, I'm always imagining that kind of Oscar reel thing. Like that's the clip they're gonna choose while they are highlighting their best performances. And mm -hmm. Sidney Poitier has one of these in here near the end of the movie where he's talking with his dad, and yeah. It was so poignant and so well acted. It's basically he just says to his dad, stop putting yourself onto me. Like, you see yourself as a man of colour. I see myself yeah. as a man. 
Yeah. And that is that is a very powerful moment in the story because even even Get Out deals with that kind of themes like just because they are of a minority that doesn't mean that they like being reminded of that every time they just want to sort of blend in and be treated like everybody else which they really should be at the end of the day of course and i mean he did a great job in that scene he absolutely did he did a great that is i think the the you know build up of not necessarily anger but sort of no, not not I'd discomfort. Say f- more frus- frustration. Frustration, because he says he loves his dad at the end of the day. Yeah. right? it's frustration that you've sort of seen a bit under the surface from John the entire film, but he's just sort of dealt with it up to this point. Well, not less tolerated it is probably a better word. Up to this point, from and he goes obviously earlier in the film he goes to you know, uh, his fiancée's parents and basically says, if if you're not okay with this, I'm not going to marry her because, you know, how could I do that? Mm-hmm. How could I be not accepted in my own wife's family? And I think that shows... Which is just a how very s- difficult choice. It shows just how selfless his character really is. Absolutely. Absolutely, but like you said, when it when it gets to the 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 latter part of the of the film, and he has that big scene with his with his father, all the frustration that has been built up from people saying, you know, not directly saying, and that is, I think, bit of a tangent. That is what the this film does very well. No one is outright bad in this film at all really it's more passive aggressive in its nature yeah. really it's a very it's subtle in its arguments um not arguments it's subtle in its for example spencer tracy uh, towards the beginning you don't you understand where he's coming from but he doesn't outright say i don't want you to marry a black man but you fully understand where he's coming from, and that's what the that's what the writing of the film is clearly good in that sense because that's what he does very well. It doesn't like if it if it did come out with that sort of stuff, it'd come off as ridiculous. And I imagine films since this have tried putting this message out there, but have been written so to the point and in your face. Poorly in your face that it's just come off as bad and forced and nobody wants that but Sidney Poitier and his frustration in the film is it's definitely built up and you can tell it's built up from within his performance up until that one particular scene quite similar to sort of Spencer Tracy in that way but in the sort of opposite way. Whereas at the start, he's like, well, okay, let's just try and talk this through. But then he gets... It's sort of a frustration that's building up in in Sidney Poitier. He's sort of mirrored by this realisation that's building up in Spencer Tracy, which... Well, you see it because he talks to he talks to John's mom, mother, and that's a really good scene towards the end of the film where she is trying to make him fight. You know, finally realize what's going on and say, basically, say you like you don't know what love is anymore if you think that this isn't correct and all. I'm paraphrasing wildly, but that's basically what she's saying, and it makes him realise that no, I I still love my wife, and yeah, why why can't these two? And of course, Spencer Tracy then says "son of a bitch" or something, and walks back inside and gives his big monologue. 
which and, uh, is I talked before go, about. Go, please talk about his monologue. I mean, you talk about having scenes that just show off an actor's range. Th- that for Spencer Tracy was just like textbook in terms of doing that. It's so well filmed. It's so well edited. It's so well written to the point that it can it kind of covers everything his characters learned. I mean, I was looking again at the arcs every character in this movie has, like. Sidney Poitier's character, he sort of learns to stand up for himself by the end. Uh, Mm -hmm. Spencer Tracy learns to kind of, I want to phrase this correctly, sort of put his own thoughts aside for somebody that he cares about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Catherine Hepburn's character, she has that nice little arc with her worker friend. And she, yeah, that's a yeah, that's a oh, what a scene that is. We'll talk about that. She she learns like um, not to worry about like her image and stuff, and then it all comes together, and they all learn that, like we've been saying for this whole video, love is the most important thing when mm-hmm. it comes to this sort of thing. Not all the little details or anything like that. If you love somebody, that's love, and there's no question about it. Of course, and uh, well. There are certain a certain real world aspects to that final monologue of Spencer Tracy's that um, I think is another reason why this film has been so remembered over the over the decades. Um, obviously, if you know anything really about old Hollywood and celebrities in old Hollywood. Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy were on again, off again for years, in in a in an affair, in real in relationship, in just all over. And this was one of Spencer Spencer Tracy's final films because he happened to be quite ill uh, at the time. And basically, listening to him pouring his heart out about how much he loves Catherine Hepburn. And then in the background of that one beautiful shot, you've got Catherine Hepburn crying her eyes out. That's not as her character. That's her. It's great when real life can kind of bleed into art like that, because that's where the best writing comes from. It comes from that, like, sense of pain. Like, I get that when I write my own stuff. And mm-hmm. it clearly happens here with even his own acting. The writing works so well with his real-life performances that that comes off as so genuine and honest. And that's why that scene works so well. Yeah, I mean, you know, just, th- just think about that. If If the man you have loved for however many years, or the woman you've loved for however many years, comes out with a speech like Spencer Tracy does at the end of Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. But it actually means quite a bit of something in his own personal life, in the both of your own life. How is that not going to make you cry? That's why, that, right there, you'd think that would be why Spencer Tracy would win an Oscar. But that is why Catherine Hepburn won the Oscar. Those tears of her real-life feelings towards Spencer Tracy. And they are such a good couple as well. They have incredible chemistry. Even when they're kind of like being a bit horrible to each other. It's so, it's, it's, it's a bit light-hearted and it is where some of the fun does come from. Like when she just starts laughing at him with the whole ice cream business. That is, that is legitimately hilarious. And I love that. (laughs) It just represents um, what real couples are like sometimes. Yeah. They'll fight, but even something as simple as going to an ice cream parlor that can bring out the best in them, that's that's kind of beautiful. Yeah, that you know, that's a that's towards the sort of middle of the film and that I think is it's showing what John's mother tells Spencer Tracy at the end when she when she's going on about how if you don't accept, you know, this marriage, you don't know love anymore. Well, we've already seen that they, that they still know love. They're still in a one... They're still wonderful with each other. You know, however many years 
it is later for them. Um, everyone can argue with the significant other and disagree, even on you know major things like the marriage of your child. But uh, I think I think I've actually realised why that ice cream parlour scene is in there. It's to show the loving side of Spencer Tracy mm-hmm. to to his wife. And and the interesting um, thing is that Catherine Hepburn actually never saw the movie after it was completed because I the, don't I don't imagine she did. The memories I think of that far been, too hard. Yeah, and. From what I've seen, Spencer Tracy died only like seventeen days after they finished filming yeah, it. Not long, and yeah, but that's ridiculous, really, isn't it? But what a great like talk about ending on a high note. Talk about f- ending on a high note with that goddamn monologue. Well done, Spencer Tracy. Hmm. I, th- I think it's it's safe to say that is what Spencer Tracy is most remembered for. I think, and he has done a lot of stuff. The only other Before thing I know this. him from is uh, Jekyll and Hyde from the forties. Well, yeah, but he um, he has done a lot of stuff before this. Some of which I'm sure we'll get to on this show. Most but likely, yeah. That is that is really what he is known for. I I can't think of a, of an actor that has finished like like you said finished on such a high, and people can go around giving me all the Heath Ledger they want to, but this is a show about old films. Because um, that's, that's nowhere near as meaningful as what Spencer Tracy does in this. Again, with the real-life ramifications as well. I, d- I don't ridiculous. exactly think you can compare the character of the no, Joker you can't. to this character. No, you certainly can't. I'm not trying to do that. No one's trying to do that. Uh, God... Yeah, though. This is a we great t- movie, though. Oh, it is. We were going to talk about uh, Catherine Hepburn's relationship with her work colleague. Oh, she is and the worst. That is a thing. She is. She is actually. I said before that there weren't necessarily any quote unquote evil characters in this film. She isn't nice. She's really not nice, and we see her early on. Like she, she, she in like the opening scene. Yeah, she is every bigoted work colleague you've ever met put she into is. one. She is. We see her in the opening scene, I think, when when the two of them land back in, in San Francisco. Another San Francisco film, by the way. That's two out of four San Francisco films. Um, just If anyone's keeping stats, which no one is keeping stats... They are um, keeping stats, I believe, on the Shrek references. They are, but that's um, that's not counted. We're not counting that one. I know. That I can't think of any count. for this film because it's too damn good. Good. I'm so glad. Um, but yeah, we see her in the in the first scene, and they go when they're in a museum. For some reason, they've gone to a museum. Oh no, have they gone to a museum to to try and find Catherine Hepburn? I think so. Yeah. Um. <laughs> And then, oh no, no, Hildy or whatever her name is. Of course, she's called Hildy. Um, no, she she's there instead. Oh hi, oh hi, I, oh oh, you've met someone, have you? Oh, you've you met? Oh oh, and then she doesn't automatically catch on that it's Sydney Poitier, but then after a while, and then it's just like, oh for God's sake, woman, get a grip of yourself. Ugh, but it does make that final scene with her so satisfying. It does, because she comes back to the house. <laughs> and this is when everything has been fully... This is when Catherine Hepburn has completely decided, yeah, this is fine, I'm happy with this, let's do it. And she comes back and she's giving it... Again, it's subtle. Uh, and that is... Again, a, a credit to the writing of this film. But she's basically giving it the whole, what, you're okay with this? What do you mean you're okay with this? How can you be okay with this? Catherine Hepburn then takes her back to her car and tells her to permanently get lost. I, I, I cheered so much at that. <laughs> it is, I think it's a great line to try and perfect your Catherine Hepburn impression as well. 
Yes. Get permanently lost. <laughs> <laughs> it's so wonderful. I lo- it's just Again, it's that- delivered with such like sort of nihilism that it makes bleak. it so funny. She's pleased to be saying it. Uh, yeah, but like her tone sounds so nihilistic, but it's so gleeful as well. Yeah. It's just it, it's really funny in a really dark kind of way. Oh yeah. It's a it's a sign that Catherine Hepburn never lost her wit. No, never did. Even you know 30 years after something like bringing up baby, she's still coming out with You know who she reminds me of lost. actually nowadays? Who? I'm interested. Uh, specifically in this movie, she reminds me a lot of how Michelle Pfeiffer is in her roles nowadays. Okay. She has that kind of wit balance with drama and those slightly comedic moments. That Pfeiffer and Hepburn, that could, that's they're kind of similar. Are you are you looking for the for the Catherine Hepburn biopic starring Michelle Pfeiffer? I would watch that in a heartbeat. <laughs> If they even if they can get young CGI <laughs> Michelle Pfeiffer to play her, oh, in not young up baby. CG Michelle Pfeiffer. We're not Scarface version Michelle Pfeiffer. No, we're not. We're not doing that. Uh, oh God! But, but just look at Pfeiffer's recent roles and look at sort of Hepburn's roles from this era. They are very similar. I definitely get what you what you mean. To be honest, I do get what you mean. Or Michelle even... Pfeiffer these days is bring. It does sort of. She does bring a wit to well, even like drama. Holly Hunter in the Big Sick is kind of similar. I kind of prefer that. I must say, I kind of prefer that again. Another film about interracial couples and just me and just realizing that for God's sake, what's the problem? There, there is not zero that, problem. Not that, zero not, problems. Oh, of course. Of course Lo- love whoever you want, about? unless it's like your pet or something. Don't do that. Well, people love the pets. To be fair, I mean, not love the pets. <laughs> don't don't take your pet to your fiance's dinner. Like you know what I'm saying. Don't don't do that shit. Have I know you ever there, been the, to? There are some people who have dinner. done that. Have you ever been to dinner at your pet's parents' house? <laughs> <laughs> that would be my own house. Have you ever experienced a guess who's coming to dinner situation? Oh, 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 oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, he has. Uh, not, not so much on the racial side, but sort of the different social class. Okay. Ooh, personal experience. Yes, uh, my my last girlfriend. Um, uh, let's just say her. F- her family was very. Uh, we can use bit, fake names. Not, yeah. Well, I'm. I'm not going to name them. But uh, the way They're they called. acted around me was sort of like it's. It's sort of because of what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to go into like right. film and stuff, and they're very of. Oh no! Get a real job. Do this kind of stuff. Get right. Get a house. Get a mortgage. Have five kids and. And, you know, that just wasn't for me. But they were lovely people, but we just didn't see eye to eye on those kind of things. It's not like Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, but it's, it's not, that sort it's, it's of not. It's, tension it's a, you get. Yeah. It's it's the same from a, a tension perspective. Um, it's, it's not the same from a racial perspective. As, as, as presumably, well, I don't know, you were both white. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, meeting your parents is all. You, meeting your significant other's parents is always hard. Hmm. I can. I can imagine. I mean, mm. I can't, to be honest. But that's a discussion for another time. Sometimes they can turn out to be not what you expect. Sometimes they can turn out to be super villains, like in Spider-Man: Homecoming. Sometimes they can turn out to be <laughs> like this. Yeah. Uh, and we we all, we'd all like it if if. <laughs> If parents turned out to be the final ten minutes of Who's Coming to Dinner, Space of Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. And telling her to get lost. That that would be great. And telling her to get lost. I've just thought of this now. As (laughs) What do you make of the... uh, What what do they refer to him as? He's not the priest. He's not a priest, is he? Or a vicar. What is he? 
who who Spencer Tracer is? Tracy? No, 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 no. The, the Spencer Tracy's friend. The guy who's <sighs> constantly getting drunk. If he's a vicar, then that's really hilarious. He's definitely wearing like a vicar's collar. You j- just like you will be with the wedding. Exactly. Uh, no, no, I won't. I won't actually. Won't be wearing that at all. If you've no idea what we're talking about, there, good. <laughs> <laughs> Morgan will be dressed as a vicar, drinking the wine at the communion vicars. <laughs> 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 but that that's oh, just what he does oh on weekends. God. There's not an actual Drinking wedding. communion wine. <laughs> no, let's not do that. I, I what I, what um I must admit what sort of stood out to me watching watching this again this time that hasn't stood out to me in the past is this is the sense that you sort of expect it's it's strange because you expect the people that almost hate it most to accept it. Yeah. If you know what I mean, and yeah, yeah. and the people that accept it the most are almost the ones that you didn't expect to. For example, the religious leader at that time. Oh yeah. Who is all for it? He's just like, yeah, this is great. I'm just hammered. <laughs> uh, I, I wish. But he's I, no, he's I he wish. is like fully supportive, he, and he tries his best as well to try and make Spencer Tracy see their point of view. Uh, and they, you know, they are friends of presumably decades, and that's you know, it's it's. It's nice. It's nice to see um, the sort of community coming together to make the one. It's very similar in that sense to Twelve Angry Men. Oh in yeah, the sort definitely. Of sense that everybody sort of one by one comes to realise the actual real uh, point, for lack of a better word, and has to finally convince the one. One guy left. Um, and uh, which t- 12 Angry Men could Tracy. definitely be something we do on this show. Oh, absolutely, I would think. Oh, certainly. Without question. I would think it's been a while since I've watched 12 Angry Men as well. But that's that That was just a thought that popped into me there. In this, I get what you uh, mean, though. Like They all come together through mutual understanding, through their own ways, and create what's get that the final 10 minutes of guess who's coming to dinner they create that kind of communal moment and it's it's they built to it so it. well and it's a nice it's a nice ending shot of them all just walking into the dining room and finally actually eating something finally having the dinner because like finally for, having for the a dinner that the called... housekeeper had been complaining about for hours for a movie called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, it really no makes eating. you wait for the dinner part. <laughs> no eating in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. And the it's housekeeper will let you know that. It's it's not too dissimilar to the people who think that To Kill a Mockingbird is about killing mockingbirds. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is not. No, it's not. To Kill a Mockingbird is certainly not about killing mockingbirds. And Guess Who's, well, guess who's Coming to Dinner actually has the words guess who's coming to dinner in it yes but the dinner doesn't happen till the very end no it doesn't but the doesn't happen at all yes so in that sense it's actually quite different because dinner actually does take place and dinner plans are made in guess who's coming to dinner i haven't even been drinking baileys and you've already got me on these weird tangents i'm blaming the fucking weather blame the weather why are you blaming the weather I don't know. I don't like snow. It doesn't like me. It's making me crazy. Just just for those who haven't heard, um, snow is happening in Britain right now. The beast from the east has came. I'm, I and refuse I hate to it. call. I refuse to call it that. It's a stupid name <laughs> made up by somebody stupid, probably at the BBC. Probably Pierce Morgan. Actually, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, maybe. Although I came up with a... I was speaking to my dad yesterday. Sorry for this weird tangent, but roll with me. Because I think it's quite interesting. 
I was uh, speaking to my dad the other day about why it might be called the Beast from the East. It's from Siberia, how... isn't it? Yeah, but and how it might prophesize uh, Russian overtaking of Western politics. Oh my God! <laughs> They're damaging us. <laughs> the Russians are damaging us with the snow, and will now interfere with our politics. Oh, it was just God. A, just a, just a wild prophecy I came up with the other day. You you should write that into a book somewhere. In fact, I'm going to take that prophecy and write it into one of my books. I, yeah. <laughs> and, but guess who's coming to dinner? Great movie. No, Thanks nothing for recommending about, to absolutely it. nothing about snow Russians or anything like that. It is a wonderful, wonderful movie. The reason I picked this movie, well, what was supposed to be last week, was uh, for Sidney Poitier and the fact it was Black History Month. And it was also Sidney Poitier's 91st birthday. Yes, the man still is alive. And probably as wonderful as ever. So much presence on screen that that man has. He commands the screen, I think. Um, You know, to, to steal scenes that involve Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy, Sidney Poitier... He was is is a special actor and filmmaker and everything and i really it's not the one he won the oscar for he won the he won the oscar for in the heat of the night which is as you might expect another movie about racial tension um as for a lot of poitier's movies around this time probably for a reason um but this, guess who's coming to dinner? Just it's it's the message of of love and acceptance of a relationship that makes it stand out for me, and it's what and that is why that is why I chose it. I could not envision doing this show without having talked about or without having been able to talk about guess who's coming to dinner. Could you imagine doing a uh, double bill of this movie and get out? Yeah. Two very different it's an tonal appropri- films. It's an appropriate but... double feature. It's a very appropriate double feature. I would almost I wouldn't prefer it at all. That's a, that's the wrong thing I would say. I was going to say I would prefer it if Sidney Poitier stabbed Spencer Tracy with a stag's antler. <laughs> but I wouldn't I wouldn't prefer that at all. I much prefer the fact that everybody just comes together at the end and has a nice meal together. I mean, that definitely wasn't going to happen in Get Out. No, no, it wasn't. No, no nice meals were had in Get Out. There was that one awkward meal. <sighs> oh, God. But, uh, the funny thing is, I think the way we talk about Guess Who's Coming to the Dinner now mm. will be how people talk about Get Out a couple decades later. So I think it's cool that we get to experience that in our sort of time and that other people got to experience that in their time. Absolutely. But as far as I'm concerned, the way people talk about Guess Who's Coming to Dinner now is the same way people will talk about Guess Who's Coming to Dinner in 20, 30, 40, 50 years' time. Because it is a It is a film that is utterly timeless until there is e- entire acceptance of this kind of thing in the world, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner will always be a relevant film to watch. And it's not heavy in its content. It deals quite light-hearted with it, but ver- but has those moments of of power that really, really hit. It's not in any way a sort of, you know, <sighs> slow, dark film. It's quite a it's quite a nice light oh I'm I'm actually enjoying watching this type film, but then every so often you get a big powerful sort of scene and it pulls Stanley Kramer, who is the director, I think does does a great job as well. I love Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. I'm so glad we got to talk about it. Me too, and if there was something I could compare to it nowadays, I guess it could be a movie like Silver Linings Playbook, which takes a similar kind of 
similar kind of uh, viewpoint, but with a different kind of theme and stuff. This would be a great little addition for that. I would put this on a date movie as well. Guess who's coming to dinner would be yeah, fantastic. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. All the Catherine Hepburn movies are going on to our date movie playlist. You know, not, not that, that we well, actually go on those. Yeah. No, we're... <laughs> We just do this show like twenty four seven. We just do this. This is what we do. Anyway, um, so do, what are we going to be talking about next week? Well, it's actually your choice. Is it? Week, it? Oh, it certainly is. As as uh, as you well know, no one gets the odd number choices, and Nolan is 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 fully committed. I oh, am yeah. to 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 oh. one choice in particular, uh, which is. Jason and the Argonauts. Bourne. Not Jason Bourne. No, I, Not screw Jason, Jason Bourne. Bourne. It's the most this overrated is a, action a, franchise. Again, but Jason and the Argonauts is, is uh, fucking great. This, yes, it is. This is this is a show. If you have, if you or weren't already familiar, which you, quite you, you damn well should be, this is a show about films from before the late sixties. Jason Bourne is not a film from before the late 60s. Jason and the Argonauts was made in 1963 and is so different to the ones we've talked about already on this. I cannot wait for that discussion. It's going to be wonderful. I love Jason and the Argonauts so much. It's so fun. And I can't wait to have that discussion with you. I think it'll be quite a different discussion to the one we've just had on Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, I can say that for sure. Definitely. So, um, any final thoughts before I lead us out? I will just say, just, if, if you want to watch a film about, if you want to watch the film that celebrates love more than any other film I've ever watched, just watch Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Just, just do yourself a favour. And that's all I'm saying. And with that, I will say thank you so much for tuning into this episode. And uh, go check out Guess Who's Coming to Dinner if you haven't seen it. If you've seen it already, go rewatch it because it's bloody great. And uh, next week we will be talking about Jason and the Argonauts, which, as you can tell, I am very, very excited about. So until then, I'm Nolan Dean. You can hit me up at NolanDean27. You are Morgan Robinson. You can hit him up at... At the Purple Don, but with a three instead of the E. Because you're just cool like that. Because I'm just cool like that. Be no, because, because, and if you know, you know, because Patrice Evra. That's why it's got a three in there. Because Patrice Evra. Sports but reference. Yeah, thanks, guys, for what uh, for listening. I should say, not watching. You can't see us. Thanks for listening to episode four of It's a Wonderful One. For Nolan Dean. I am Morgan Robinson. Goodbye.